So our next presenter, Dr. Anya Silver, attended graduate school at Emory University and specialized in Victorian literature, children's literature, women's studies, and poetry. She's a professor of English at Mercer University in Macon, Georgia. She has also retained her love for teaching and writing poetry. Her work has appeared in North American Review, Many Mountains Moving, Cream City Review, The Laurel Review, and The Iowa Review, among others. She has also published two books of poetry, The 93rd Name of God, and her most recent collection, I Watched You Disappear, both from LSU Press. Image said of her poetry, Anya Silver belongs to the ancient tradition of meditation on the name of God, not as a way of containing and owning God, but as a way of entering into communion. She sees the possibility of transcendence everywhere, not only in the Torah and the sacraments, but in insects, the peeling of bells, tree bows, boughs, pastry, and the human spine. Her voice is straightforward, her poems refreshingly intelligible and unapologetically pleasing, even pretty. Please join me in wel welcoming all the way from Georgia, Anya Silver. Well, thank you, some of you, for staying. That's, <laughs> I really appreciate it. Um, I am from Macon, but I spent all of my childhoods in Vermont because my father taught Russian at the um, Middlebury College Language School. So Vermont really has always been like a second home to me, and I'm really thrilled and honored to be here. Um, I'm going to read from my poems, my two books, and um, I always begin with this poem. This is um, called The Canticle of the Washing Machine. Um, a canticle is a hymn of praise, and the most famous one is probably St. Francis's Canticle of the Sun, in which he praises Sister Water and Brother Wind and Sister Moon and other natural elements. But I chose to praise um, something more every day, the washing machine. Um, and there are some parts of the washing machine that I mentioned in this poem, um, including the flange and the ringer and the pulley. Those are just parts of a washing machine. And when I refer to um, the, um, the meek, uh, it'll make sense when I read it. I'm referring to socks in a washing machine. Canticle of the Washing Machine. Be praised, my Lord, for the washing machine whose swingle flails the soiled and stained. For he ministers to the splot, the blotch, the spattered cuff. Be praised, my Lord, for your spirit that comes upon him, for his jump and whirl and jug, jug, jug. My infant son slept on his shaking back, the meek love him and cling to his sides. For the flange which shakes the floorboards sends the cat beneath the bed. Be praised, my Lord, for the agitator through whose pivot and plunge into tub many of the most smudged are cleaned. Be praised, my Lord, for the delicate cycle in which lace and wool can eddy. Blessed is the soapy breath that sweetens each room of my house. Praise and bless the Lord whose will is done by these God's servants, ringer, pulley, drum. This next poem is a ghazal, which is a, an Arabic form of poetry. It consists of couplets, and they're really autonomous couplets, but they repeat um, a phrase or a word. And um, the phrase repeated in this poem was also the title, which is the name of God. But there's not really a, a narrative running through it. They're really just images. The name of God. Like a baker swaddling the juice and heft of apples and pastry, I want my mouth to cradle the delicious name of God. Kissing the Torah, I breathe the dust that has lain on the name of God, imagine ink on my indrawn breath. I will dream myself into the body of a bee. I will enter the honeycomb and sip the scent of blackberry in the golden name of God. I will open the windows of my house, 
so the name of God can write itself on my walls with pigments of breeze and pollen, with stylus tipped in light. If my heart were an amber room, I would inscribe the name of God over its doorways, and once a year I would flame it down to spicy smoke and oil. When I was a girl, I drank from the chalice and felt the wine's heat travel down my bones, each pressed grapes drop a lit with the secret name of God. And later, full of grief, I let a woman press hard against my spine and felt life rushing again through my body, releasing the clenched up name of God. I want the name of God to frost over my sight, to loop the tides to my ears. How can I be frightened with those vowels in my lungs flaring like paper lanterns? Uh, I grew up in the Russian Orthodox Church where Mary, um, the Virgin Mary, is venerated, which means that um, you can't worship Mary, but you can pray to Mary for intercession and for prayers. And for me, it was very important to have a female face of God in the church. And I never saw Mary as somehow um, submissive or um, uh, I never saw her as an, uh, in an unfeminist way, I guess I'll say. I mean, I always saw her as a figure of female power. Um, and so I wanted to write a poem about Mary. Um, the phrase Maria Fundam Schnee means M Mary of the Snow, and it appears in an HD poem called Tribute to Angels, and there's a little church called Maria Fundam Schnee. Mary. There's a Mary for everything, for limestone, for subways, for birches. There's a Mary for college football, for the homeless, for abandoned cats and dogs, for sneaker factories and suburbs. Everywhere she casts pitying eyes over cathedrals and gardens, rearview mirrors and asphalt highways. And in one small village in Austria, Maria von dem Schnee, heaped with candles and evergreen boughs, blesses the snow blesses the skiers, the bootmakers, the cows in their stalls stomping and breathing white plumes through the soundless snowy evenings. When in my narrow bed sleep won't come, I think of Maria's placid face, her small hands folded, her perpetual benedictions of frosted over car windows and frozen locks, and my own heart frigid in its socket, the day I told my lover that I wanted to leave, our bedsheets and our hands chapped with cold. She was my own Mary then. She knew my thoughts like a mother. She whispered, be still, my daughter, and covered me in her easy snow, blessing my winter, its deep and early shadows, the ice beneath my eyelids, and the good, good sleep. When I was 35 and pregnant with my son, I was diagnosed with breast cancer um, with a very aggressive form of breast cancer called inflammatory breast cancer. It was the most aggressive and lethal form of breast cancer. And I went through chemo while I was pregnant. Um, and at that time, I hadn't been going to church. I, just, I decided to go back to church to try it out because when you think you're about to die, you start wondering what's going to happen to you um, and if maybe there any, something else will happen or if not. And I made the mistake of going to the Episcopal church that I now belong to um, on um, uh, baptism day. So there were all these women carrying their babies up and down the aisles, and here I was bald and pregnant. It was horrible. And I just burst into tears and ran out of the church um, and went into the bathroom and just sat in the bathroom and was weeping. And this poem came out of that experience. Um, a, you all will probably know what a persimmon is, but it's, an or, it's a very soft orange fruit, and it, it's sort of breast-like. Um, so, pers oh, and, and one more thing. Um, I was attending, um, my husband's Jewish, and so we, sometimes we attend um, the 
temple downtown in Macon, Georgia. And it was built by the Masons who put their symbol of the eye in the dome of a temple, which is, if you know anything about Judaism, you're not supposed to have representations of God in houses of worship, so it's very bizarre that there's this, this eye looking down at you. So this is about that experience. Persimmon. I place you by my window so your skin can receive the setting sun, so your flesh will yield to succulents, lush with juice, so the saints of autumn will bless your flaming fruit. Because cancer has left me tired, because when I visit God's houses, I enter and leave alone, not even in the melting beeswax and swinging musk of incense has God visited me, not when I've bowed or kneeled or sung. Because I have found God instead when I've crouched in bathrooms, lain back for the burning of my skin, covered my face and cursed. Persimmon, votive candle at the icon of my kitchen window, your four-petaled stem, the eye of God and the temple's dome, tabernacle of pulp and seed, dwelling place for my wandering prayers. I am learning from you how to praise, because when your body bruises and is softened, you are perfected, because your soul, persimmon, is sugar. I'm going to turn to my second poem, book of poems, um, and read some. I took some maple leaves because we don't get those in Georgia. Um, about, I was in remission for about five and a half years, and then I had a recurrence. Um, so I'm living with ca advanced cancer. And even in the cancer community, um, nobody really wants to talk to you if you're stage four because you're everybody's nightmare. And so a lot of women who are living with stage four, and I know a lot of them, feel very um, alienated, even from the people who should be their sisters, other people, women who have had cancer of some sort. And so this poem is about that experience of having becoming someone with metastatic cancer. And it begins with an epigraph by a wonderful Serbian poet, Dragan Jovanovic Danilov, who was um, translated by Charles Simic, I have no other body, no other city. This is called stage four. It's an allegory. Suddenly, gloved hands empty the rooms of my house, and I'm told to take only what I can carry. Faces turn away from me. I'm taboo now. The boat I'm set inside is crowded with others like myself. They come from their own cities. Cautiously, we take each other's hands and trade stories. We learn of the lucky few who are able to return, who are able to cross back over, I'm sorry. And in time, their shame comes to be known as victory. We use words that once embarrassed us, courage, prayer, miracle. And always we long for our old homes. We draw scarves over our faces when we weep singing the songs of our ancestors. In this exile, no pillar of dust and fire guides us. Our passports have been stamped. Our wrists and collarbones have been marked. Even when the old promises begin to fall away, when we see less clearly the gardens of our former lands, still we are together, friends, and we know what our beloveds do not yet know. We can see through each other to the lapping silence beyond the Milky Way. This next word includes the F-bomb, which I don't usually put in my poems, but this is a really angry poem. Um, it was written about a friend who died, and I don't know if there are any children around if I should bleep the F-word. I don't see any children, so I'm, I'm just going to say it. Um, uh, so this is sort of a found poem, and I don't, let me get my watch. Okay. Um, this, this is sort of a found poem. I took lines from emails from other women with cancer um, and who were dying of cancer to write this poem. 
I watched you disappear. That fucking doctor killed you, killed you. But I keep sending emails to your account. It's still open. Your husband told me he heard you calling him the other night. You should see the way he matches your daughter's clothes. You would snort water out of your nose laughing. Today, a green hummingbird hovered right before my face. Are you there? Where? Are the others there too? You looked like a Stevie Nicks in your scarf and sunglasses. That trip to Peru never happened. You should have spent the money. You were so thin by the end. I love you, I love you, I love you. Your son is on suicide watch. He can't be left alone. I keep finding your feathers. Is it true that the morphine worked? The nurses were just guessing near the end. I'm sorry that I didn't want your nightgown. I should have taken it. It scared me too much. I give it one year, max. I hate spring, its prettiness. Your heart kept beating. Why didn't it just stop? You left in a bandana from your drawer of bandanas. You pulled yourself up one last time on the bed rails. You left into no more letters. You left three translations of Akhmatova. You left your Lady of Guadalupe by the window. You left your lungs, liver, spine. You left in the thinnest hours of the morning. You left on your last out-breath. You left into silence. You left me. You left them. You left us. I watched you disappear. I'm a little strange in that Ash Wednesday is one of my favorite holidays because everyone's going to die. And if you go to Ash Wednesday services and have the cro a cross put on your forehead, you think, I'm not the only one dying around here. This person over there is going to die too. You know, this person could die before I do. It's, it's very comfort. Death is very comforting to me in the fact that we're all going to die. I, I always, I, I love telling my students this. I love telling them, you know, in 70, 80 years, you're going to be dead. You know, <laughs> so, I mean, you're not going to live like this forever. Um, but anyway, I was on the way to Ash Wednesday services and I was late. And one thing that happens when you have cancer as a woman, um, and probably as a man too, but I can't speak to that experience, is that you become very desexualized. You lose a breast or two breasts. You lose your hair. You gain weight or you, or you lose weight. You, stop, you feel like you stop being sexually attractive or a sexual person. And there are all, all other side effects that I won't go into detail here because we have men in the audience, but just trust me, they're, they're there. So I was listening to this, um, a sexually explicit song that's not quoted in here, um, on my way to church for Ash Wednesday, and I thought, this is so bizarre, I have to write a poem about it. So this is called Sexually Explicit Lyrics, Ash Wednesday. Because I will never have sex like this again, I listen to the music and sing as if I will, as if I weren't on the short spur to death, now that tumors freckle my right lung, sparkling on the PET scan like tossed confetti. Oh yes, I can pretend that I'll get whatever I like, can imagine my body made up of cells shimmering like the, my headlights on the wet road late for church. I can dream of how it was when I had decades left of sex and of somebody wanting my body, this body that seeks now a space in the pews and kneels in silence for the placement of ashes, for the thick black cross that will put an end to all that false, sweet crooning that will settle into the folds of my forehead more obscene than the words earlier purring in my throat. Okay, I don't want to read all cancer poems because I, people start referring to me as the cancer poet and I, I don't really want to be the cancer poet. Um, so I'm going to read an autumn poem. Um, I mean, unless you want more cancer poems. Then I have two books of cancer poems. <laughs> so I always work cancer. Um, this is a poem called um, Apple Salvation based on a Russian um, 
festival called the Salvations. There's a honey salvation, an apple salvation, a nut salvation. There are three of these. They're pre, they're pre Christian pagan holidays. And this one is called Apple Salvation. There's a stranger in the field of apples. Somebody's hands have left a blush on the stamens, have scattered half-rotten fruit in which wasps will burrow. Somebody's presence has spun the sugar, banished bitterness from yellow cores. Pips have polished themselves like beaks of sparrows, sweet wines waxed tender. Now is the time for us to climb ladders and fill a crate for our family's pleasure, to hear the tick-tock of falling fruit, to lighten the bearded branches. Let husbands feel the round arms of their wives and wives laugh in voices rich as custard. Let there be shouting like shaken tambourines. Let the musician bring his fiddle. Well, I'm back to cancer. Um, <laughs> not really, but, but indirectly. Um, late Renoir paintings are often considered the nadir of his work. Renoir, when he grew older, the Impressionist painter, tended to paint a lot of um, nude women um, frolicking in ponds. Um, and uh, I don't also sort of dismiss his, his painting. But I found out afterwards that they were painted after World War I when his son was very badly injured and his wife died. And um, he suffered from a horrible rheumatoid arthritis that made it very, very painful for him to paint. But he got up and he painted every day despite the pain. And um, I admired that. Um, and he also stopped using any black in any of his paintings. That's, there's a reference to that. Late Renoir. To inhabit these bathing bodies, pink, nude, with upturned breasts and nipples like rosewater candy, is to smudge away doubt, to blend beneath willow green and azure the mutilation of war, his dead wife, the black he banished from his canvas. Always the angles lushly rendered, women's thighs and bellies luminous, edible like tinted meringues. Nannies, nymphs whose hair swept their shoulders like etudes in the major key. And yet beneath the lace, the hook and eye of pain, hands crippled with arthritis, the cold snap of knowledge like a garter pressing into flesh. Extermination, the only motive for preservation. Like a peach swimming in its jar of sugared juices, hollow where the pit was knifed away. Um, I'll read one or two more poems. I'll read one, okay, I'm going to read one more poem about, a short poem about um, cancer and the the experience of having it, and I'm just quickly trying to figure out which ones I want, which one I want to read. I think I'm going to um, read this one. This This is a harsh one, so, and then I'll end with a happier one. Um, when I was in remission, I, of course, was afraid that I would um, have a recurrence, which I did. Um, and when I was in remission, I wrote this poem to myself as if I had had a recurrence and were stage four. Um, so it's sort of odd to read it now that I am stage four. Um, but it captures that. It goes against the pink ribbon culture that we've been fed in our culture from certain powerful foundations. Letter to myself and remission from myself, terminal. You'll come to hate your own poems. Read them as pretty wisps of wishful thinking. All those images, just a splash of colored oil sloshed open over a pool gone rancid. Admit it. 
Atheists always scared you, and no wonder. Those nights you switched on the fan so no one could hear you scream into your pillow, weeping and biting your own hands like a motherless monkey, banded to a body that despised you, a suit of coals with a jammed shut zipper. Instead of the truth, you took refuge in stories and souls, wore the word survivor like a pink nimbus. All the while, my dear, I waited, knowing you'd catch up to me someday. I'm holding the black-backed mirror to your face. Look into it. Okay. Um, I'm going to end with a title poem of my first, of my first book. Um, I attend Sufi meditations, and we did a meditation, um, meditations um, on light. And the 93rd name of God is Yanur, which means light. And so this poem is, it really is a meditation on light. The 93rd name of God. If I can breathe light into my nostrils... If breath can open my crown so that light pours downward and then outward, light drenching the brain and puddling in my sockets, light running down my throat straight into the cavity of my chest and then spreading, a light slick, light flurry, cracker snap, torrent of loose light rushing through ventricles, winding through colon, light seeping into the slub of liver and stomach, threading through ribs and pooling in the pelvis, and then through the blood and lymph, causing muscles to shimmer from within, and the skeleton too, a dancing lantern, a lattice filled with fireflies, light in the joints, the long and heavy bones, light forming sparkling runnels in the toes. And if the light didn't remain in the body, but instead, depending again on the breath, flared through the skin and dispersed into a fog, a mist encasing the whole light-soaked body, then what of my body could be said to be separate from this light? And if the light were, were related to the light of stars, which it must be, as well as to the light of the sun, then what of me would not be star cloud, star stream? If I could immerse myself in the 93rd name of God, I would fear no longer tumor or death. I would drink light. I would rinse my hair in light. I would rub my shoulders with its grains and seeds. I would anoint myself in lunar oil. I would make love with every wide, open, glowing, humming, luminous cell of my body, pulsing and aflame. Thank you.